In this problem, we'll be looking at the equipartition theorem, which is a very useful tool for showing us how molecules can accommodate energy. That is, if we add heat to an atom or molecule, how exactly does it store that heat, and why are some molecules better at storing heat than others? Here, using the equipartition theorem, we'll predict the constant pressure heat capacity, or CP, of carbon dioxide in its gaseous form. Heat capacity tells us how much the temperature of a substance will increase for a given amount of heat added to it, and it can be measured for a system with a constant volume or a constant pressure, as in this problem. So our first step here is to calculate the total number of degrees of freedom for our CO2 molecule. A degree of freedom notes the different motions or ways in which a molecule can move to accommodate heat, and the total number of degrees of freedom in a molecule is given by 3 times the number of atoms in it. Here we're looking at CO2, which has three atoms, so three times three atoms gives us nine total degrees of freedom. Now that we know it's got nine degrees of freedom, we can partition those degrees of freedom into different means of motion. So of our nine degrees of freedom for our CO2 molecule, the first ones that we can discuss are translations. Now because this is a gaseous molecule, it can move around freely in space, and it can do so in three directions, an X direction, a Y direction, and a z-direction. That means we've got three different means of translation. This molecule also has possible rotations associated with it. So if we look at the CO2 molecule, we can spin it around like this, and that's a perfectly acceptable way of storing energy. Not only can we do it in that direction that we just saw it spinning, but we can also do it along this axis here, with the oxygen atoms coming into and out of the screen. It might look like we should be able to rotate along this axis as well, but that actually doesn't have a meaningful enough moment of inertia to store any energy, and therefore we cannot count that axis as a possible rotation axis. This is going to be true of any linear molecule. Linear molecules can only have two rotational degrees of freedom. This is also the same reason that only molecules instead of atoms can have rotational degrees of freedom, because atoms, which are just spheres, do not have large enough moments of inertia to store any energy by rotating. Our third type of motion that can store energy in a molecule is called a vibration. And here we can calculate the number of vibrational degrees of freedom by noting that there's nine total degrees of freedom, and so far we have five accounted for, meaning that we must have four leftover vibrational degrees of freedom. For our molecule, those are as follows. You can take the two oxygen atoms and you can stretch them out symmetrically relative to the carbon atom in the center. The oxygen atoms can also undergo what's called an asymmetric stretch, where they're both moving in the same direction relative to the carbon atom. There's also these bending vibrational modes, in which the oxygen atoms can be moving up and down relative to the carbon atom, and that can occur in two directions, both in the plane of the screen and out of the plane of the screen. Note finally that the phase of our molecule here matters. We're looking at a gaseous carbon dioxide molecule, and because it's a gas, it's able to freely translate and rotate in space. When you look at a solid, solids are locked in their positions in a lattice, and therefore they can only vibrate, so that's going to affect the way that they can store energy. But now that we've partitioned our different degrees of freedom, we can add up their individual contributions to get our constant volume heat capacity. Now each of our translations contributes one half R to our heat capacity, where R is the ideal gas constant. Recall that R can be given in units of joules per mole Kelvin. So we can see that with R, we're measuring the amount that the temperature will raise in Kelvin for a certain amount of heat added in joules for a certain amount of our substance given in moles. So if we take all our three translational degrees of freedom and multiply each by one half R, that gives us three halves R for translation. Rotations also contribute one half R, which for the system gives us two halves R, also known as R. Now vibrations are a little bit different, they can actually store one full R of energy, and that's because, as opposed to translations and rotations, which can just store kinetic energy, vibrations can also store potential energy. So you get a half R for kinetic and a half R for potential, giving you a full R. And for the four vibrational degrees of freedom in our system, that gives us four R. Now if we add all these up, we get 13 halves R, which is our constant volume heat capacity. So now we have CV equals 13 halves R, but we'll recall that in our problem we're looking for CP. Fortunately, these two are directly related to one another by this equation right here. 
CP is always going to be larger than CV because a system that is held at constant pressure is always capable of holding more energy for less change in temperature than one held at constant volume. So here we just take our 13 halves R and we add an additional R to it to get a total of 15 halves R. Now if we want an actual value, we take that 15 halves and we multiply it by the value of the ideal gas constant, 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, to end up with our constant pressure heat capacity of 62.37 joules per mole Kelvin. It's worth noting that experimentally, this value for carbon dioxide is quite a bit lower, 37.13 joules per mole Kelvin. But this is just an approximation that we can use, and it tends to be more accurate for smaller atoms or molecules. So in summary, if we want to use the equipartition theorem to determine the constant pressure heat capacity for CO2, we first determine the total number of degrees of freedom by multiplying the number of atoms in our molecule by 3. We then partition our degrees of freedom between the different motions in our molecule, and those are translations, rotations, and vibrations. We take each of their individual contributions and add them up to get our constant volume heat capacity, noting that each translation gives us half an R, each rotation also gives us half an R, and a vibration gives us a full R. And then we take our constant volume heat capacity, add one more R to it, and that gives us our constant pressure heat capacity, which for this problem was 15 halves R.